Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Mini Educators. I'm Mini Educator 1, and I am here with me. Mini Educator 2. And today we will be going over a life sciences exam that we hear me, Mini Educator 1, and 2 put together. These questions cover basically what the title says, life sciences, sciences about the ecosystem, uh, about cells, mutations, uh, body systems, etc. So we here have 50 questions. We will be splitting this video into two parts. This video will be going over questions 1 through 25, and the next video will be going over questions 26 through 50. So without further, without further ado, I will explain the first question right here, which starts with dichotomous keys. A dichotomous key of different mollusks is shown. It shows us the partial mollusk dichotomous key. Which mollusk moves by jet uh, propulsion and does not have an external shell? So always in a dichotomous key, you always have to start at the beginning. Right here we see we have two choices. External shell is present or no external shell is present. We'll look here. It tells us does not have an external shell. So here, no external shell is present. So then we go to three, as it tells us. Since the organism does not have an external shell, we go to three. And then here we have two choices, move by jet propulsion or moves by crawling with a single muscular foot. Well, let's see here. M which mollusks moves by jet propulsion? So moves by jet propulsion, that is going to be the squid. So it led us to the squid, and that is the answer to a uh, to question one is the squid. And again, just before we continue on with the video, if you all have any questions about anything, any question that you're confused about, just comment down below and be like, hey, mini educator one and two, we need help with question 38. You know, just, and we'll explain them in the next video. Now, question two, go on, mini educator two. Which statement best describes how a virus replicates? F, a virus divides into two identical virus particles before infecting the host cell. G, a virus enters a host cell and uses material from the host cell to, produ uh, to produce new virus particles. H, multiple virus particles fuse and form a large particle that breaks apart, releasing new virus particles. J, multiple viruses uh, particles break down in co uh, component parts, which then re reassemble into new copies of the virus. The answer is G, because all viruses have to have a host cell in order to reproduce. All right, on to question three. Yeah, and also, guys, uh, I think we said this in the last video. I think we said this in the last video that um we will be directly right when we start a question we will be directly just telling the answer to it so if y'all want to challenge yourself and answer the questions then i would do it right when we show you the question because right after we read it we will directly tell y'all the answer next question question number three Biting flies can transmit diseases and cause loss of blood for animals in nature. Horses have developed behaviors to repel biting flies such as ear twitching, head tossing, leg stomping, and tail swishing. Which statement best describes the interaction between body systems that allows horses to repel biting, uh, to repel the fly, uh, to repel biting flies? So we have here, um, uh, we have A, B, C, D. Let's read them. A says the nervous system senses the biting flies and sends a signal to the muscular system to move. B says the circulatory system senses the biting flies and sends a signal to the nervous system to move. C, the muscular system senses the biting flies and sends a signal to the integmatory system to move. Or D, the integmatory system sends the biting flies, senses the biting flies and sends a signal to the circulatory system to move. So the answer is A, and I will explain why it's A. Because let, okay, let's first go through the systems given in A. The nervous system is attracted to the nerves, the veins, all that stuff. The stuff that... Like when somebody touches you, your body gets alerted. Like who, who touched me? Um, and then it said sends a signal to 
sends a signal to the muscular system to move. Muscular sounds exactly like what it is. It's the muscles. It's like the movement of your body. Now, B, it says the circulatory system senses the biting flies. That doesn't make sense because the circulatory system is the blood and the air and the movement of air and blood through your body. So that doesn't make sense. So we can directly cross it off. The muscular system senses the biting flies. The flies might bite the, the area of the muscular system, but the muscular system does not sense it. The integumentary system senses the biting flies. That is somewhat true, but what is inside of the integumentary system which senses it, which truly senses it? It is the nervous system. So it is... A, the nervous system senses the biting flies and sends a signal to the muscular system, to the muscles to move. Okay? Now on to question four, mini educator two, take it away. Question number four. Oil spills in the ocean affect marine food webs. Animals that are initially affected by oil spills, including sea otters, seabirds, and other organisms that spend most of their time on the ocean surface. Based on the food web, how does significant uh, decrease in the sea otter population due to an oil spill most likely affect the ecosystem? F. The sea urchin population would increase, causing the kelp population to decrease. That is correct because the sea urchin population would increase if the sea otter population decreased, and the kelp would also decrease because they would have more predators. Um, question, uh, answer G. The fish population would increase in response to the changes in the muscle population. The fish population has pretty much nothing to do with the muscle population, other than they uh, partially take energy from kelp. A uh, H. The muscle population would increase in response to the changes in the algae population. The algae population would not. Uh, the algae population isn't necessarily increasing because. As we can see, the sea otter's um, population is decreasing. So the sea urchin population is increasing. So the algae population is decreasing. So therefore, the muscle population would decrease. J, the killer whale population would increase, causing the fish population to decrease. The sea otters are like all, de uh, the population is decreasing. So that wouldn't make sense because the killer, some of the killer whales would end up starving to death. So the fish population would increase. Now on to question five. Okay, which of these shows an example of an insertion mutation? So these are one of the, the free questions that you actually might find in your unit tests. So here we have, which of these shows an example of an insertion mutation? A, so we have, in A, we have, you know, these, uh, these, uh, uh, bases and then we see that we have RSTUV and then XYZ and then and and then after the mutation we happens we have STUV XY that means a deletion happens because they got deleted let's look at B um we have RSTUV XYZ and then here we have RSTV XYZ that means a deletion happened because the U left the u was like bye bye c uh we have r s uh r s t u v x y z and then here in c we have r u t s v x y z nothing was added here let's count them one two three four five uh six seven eight and then one two three four five six seven eight there's eight before the mutation happened and after. So this would not be correct. Let's look at D. R, S, T, U, V, X, Y, Z. And then we look next. K, L, R, S, T, U, V, X, Y, Z. It's, it, the answer is D because K and L were added to the uh, sequence after the mutation happened. Okay, now with question six, uh, mini educator two, take it away. In a central Texas grassland, the producer incorporate the in, the producers incorporate twelve thousand kilojoules of energy from the sun into their tissues. Well, how much energy would be incorporated into the tissue of her, uh, herbivores? So, the law of energy is basically where producers make a certain amount and 
every predator after that will make 10 times less energy, it would take 10 times less energy. And so herbivores are organisms that are the ones who eat the um, grass and the producers first. So the answer is G. Now on to question seven. Yes, and also I'd like to clarify something on this question. All you're doing is just you're multiplying 12,000 by 10%. Um, you multiply uh, 12,000 times 10%. And you get 1,200 kilojoules. And remember, on the star test, they will, or on any type of state test, uh, they will be giving you calculators. Or maybe on a unit test that covers this, your teacher will be giving you calculators. So all you have to do, just multiply 12,000 kilojoules by uh, 10%, and you'll get 1,200. Okay, now next question. Um, positive figmo, figmotropism is a response in plants in which they move and grow towards an object the plant comes into physical contact with, usually curling around the object. This response of the shoot system benefits the plant by allowing the plant to produce more pollen for pollinators. That makes no sense because plants, they just produce pollen. They don't have to be in a specific position to produce it. Uh, B, take in more carbon dioxide to convert into glucose. That also does not make sense because carbon dioxide is all around us. You could be in a hole under the ground, freaking like 200 feet under the ground and they'd still be carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is everywhere. So that would not be correct. C, absorb more water to transport to the leaves. Possibly if the plant was like, spreading its roots longer down the soil but moving up that wouldn't make sense d reach more sunlight for photosynthesis that is correct because think about it if you're a plant if you're a plant like this and then you like start climbing up okay if you're a plant and you're trying to find sunlight well then you're gonna start climbing up climbing up to get closer to the sun because let may possibly this plant this part of the plant might be in a shadow. So then it's like getting out of that shadow and getting closer to the sunlight so it can process photosynthesis. Okay, now uh, next question, question eight. Mini educator two, take it away. White clovers, Trifolium repens, are plants that are native to Europe and Central Asia and are able to produce the poison cyanide within their cells. Skunk cabbage, Sympolar carpus, Poyotidus is a plant that is native to eastern North America and can produce a chemical that makes it uh, that makes it have a strong foul or, uh, odor and bitter taste. The chemicals produced by both the white clovers and the skunk cabbages are adaptations that are uh, that allow them to attract more pollinators. Why would you want to go towards something that is stinky? G survive a long term drought. Smells don't really help with survival in a um dry area. H protect against herbivores. That's true because they're both um plants, and they do have um and they do have chemicals that protect them because of the smell. J grow better in colder habitats. That also doesn't make sense because. A smell or a scent doesn't really help with colder habitats either. Now on to question nine. Okay, um, so for this question, question nine, and for the rest of the Punnett Square questions, we will be adding a clip of us actually doing them on paper because it will be extremely difficult to comprehend in your head if we're just like expressing it like that so right now after this we, like right now after I, I stop speaking for this question we will be adding a clip of me actually solving it out on a piece of paper we will film it after we finish the video but yeah um enjoy the clip okay y'all now on to question nine y'all were just sent from a clip of us doing it online, but it would be much easier if we just did it 
on paper. So a model of the genetic control of coat color in rabbits is shown. We don't really need to read this. We'll figure it out after we read it. Read the question, which Punnett square represents a cross that would produce an albino offspring? I'm telling y'all, we do not need any of this. All we're looking for is that would produce an albino offspring. We are literally just looking for a Punnett square that would have a C. Okay, so here we have this. C. So here we have this C and then another C and then C H H. That is dominant, so that's not going to be albino. Here we have C C H. That's not going to work because we have the H. That's going to produce like chinchilla. Here we have C C. We bring them C C. That would work because look, because okay, y'all have to understand. Look here, this albino is recessive to all other alleles, so albino is a lower case. So then, we're just gonna meet these in the middle. So then it's gonna be lower C, lower C, and that makes albino. We do not have to try any of the others because we can just see here. There's no other combination that only has lower case C. Look. All of them. Oh, yeah. And uh, just to add that these two have to be uh, lowercase c's in order for them to create an albino. So then you can just instantly check. Oh, these are not just c's. These are not just c's. These are not just c's, but these are. Yeah. So you have to have a lowercase c on both sides of the punnet to produce a recessive alleled coat. Okay. Now on to the other scene. Okay, now on to question 10, Mini Educator 2, take it away. When a stem cell divides into, uh, it produces two daughter cells. One daughter cell will remain a stem cell, while the other daughter cell will differentiate into a specialized cell. Which factor will most directly uh, determine what type of specialized cell will be produced? Uh, the size of the cell, the stem cell, and the uh, the stem cell doesn't really do anything with that. The length of the cell cycle, that doesn't do anything with the cell again. Uh, the number of chromosomes that are replicated, that doesn't make sense. And uh, because the chromosomes, the number of chromosomes that are repli replicated will just increase, will just make it a different species completely. And the genes that are expressed, that is correct because you, uh, because what you express is like what traits you have. Like for example, if you expressed like black hair, you would, uh, if you had the alleles or genes for black hair, you would be expressing them as genes. Now on to question 11. Okay, question 11. Blue flying fish live in the upper layers of the ocean. Uh, blue flying fish have enlarged pectoral fins that enable them to glide for 400 meters above the ocean surface and appear to fly. Which statement best describes how natural selection led to enlarged pectoral fins in blue flying fish? A. Fish were able to glide out of the ocean and into other bodies of water to mate with other species? Help me, God. That is the stupidest answer choice I've ever heard in my life. So you're telling me the fish is just going to glide out of the ocean, take a walk? Hey, hmm, let's go into this ocean. Maybe we'll mate with other species. That does not make sense. B, fish were able to live both on land and in water as a result of their larger pectoral fins. That doesn't make sense because why would you need fins if you're on land? Because fins are used for transportation in the water, so that doesn't make sense. And then C, fish with enlarged pectoral fins were able to glide out of the ocean to escape predators increasing their fitness that sounds some like something you know that sounds like something i would choose and then d fish change their dna to express large enlarge oh whoa i'm not even gonna finish oh my gosh i'm not even gonna finish reading the answer choice a fish cannot just change its dna it cannot just be like okay today i'm changing my dna so the answer is c 
Fish with enlarged pectoral fins were able to glide out of the ocean to escape predators, including increasing their fitness. Guys, always, if there is ever a question that has natural selection in the question, it's always, the answer will always include fitness. Fitness is basically the ability to reproduce, the ability, the ability to survive, uh, in the ecosystem and stuff like that. So then it is going to be increasing their fitness. C, the answer is C. Now on to question 12, mini educator two, take it away. Scientists determine the total mass of DNA from a sample of animal cells. The masses of equal numbers of cells are taken during three different stages of the cell cycle. Stage one contains cells mass during G1 of the cell cycle. Now, here we have a graph. We can see stage one is about the same as stage three, but look at stage two. It's almost double of what stage one is. Which statement best describes the cell during stage two? So the mass of the DNA they're talking about is really just how much of it. And during stage two, S it's S phase. So, uh... Let's go through the answer choices. The cells have replicated their DNA, but have not completed mitosis and cytokinesis. That is correct because if they did complete mitosis and cytokinesis, there'd be two different cells. The cells have completed mitosis and cytokinesis without replicating their DNA. That does not describe stage two. That describes stage three. The cells have replicated their DNA and completed mitosis and cytokinesis. Again, Mitosis and cytokinesis divide these cells into different parts. The cells have temporarily exited the cell cycle without replicating their DNA. What? That doesn't even make sense. I mean, sure, they can go to G0, which is a phase of resting phase. But how would they replicate? How would they get double the DNA if they only had, um, if they only had a resting phase and did nothing? So the answer is F. To question 13. Okay, now on to question 13. Green anoles are lizards that can change their skin color rapidly in response to various stimuli. Stimuli. This adaptation is the result of A, selective breeding of lizards by humans. That is not correct because, listen... Humans can only select, like, they can only breed lizards to a certain extent. We can't, like, breed, like, their, their, like, their genetic processes. We cannot breed that stuff. Uh, B, beneficial traits pass from parent to offspring. That is correct. Because beneficial traits pass from parent to offspring. Uh, natural selection, uh, uh, breeded this lizard and was like okay okay green and uh green and alls what we're gonna do uh, natural selection was telling them this that we are gonna change your color uh, rapidly in response to various stimuli so like if, if there's a predator chasing them then they can just change the color of their skin and hide behind a green tree and camouflage themselves um uh, yeah, so that's correct, because one lizard, uh, the uh, lizard got it, and then they passed it on to their offspring. And then C, geographic isolation that prevented genetic mutation. That makes no sense, because, G okay, it's, guys, it's, it's, it's when anybody asks you a question about their skin color changed, anything, that is natural selection. So it is not C. Environmental pollutants that change their genotypes, nothing can change your genotypes. It does not matter. Even okay, even natural selection can't change your genotypes. Natural selection can only change your phenotypes. The mutations that are caused by natural selection may change your genotypes. But yeah, it is B, beneficial traits passed from pair to offspring. Now, question 14, very easy question, very simple one. Uh, here, Mini Educator 2 will explain it. Which type of movement across the cell's plasma membrane requires energy su uh, supplied by ATP? Passive transport. Passive transport is called passive transport because it doesn't need any type of energy. Simple diffusion. That is That does not require um, any ATP. Active transport. 
that's the only one that really needs any type of energy because it's usually a type of movement where um there will be an imbalance so um the so the answer would be active transport and j osmosis that's a type of passive transport now on to question 15 okay now question 15 Leaf cutter ants harvest leaves and carry them to fungi that convert plant material into a usable form for the ants to digest. The fungi depend on the leaves for nutrients. The, ant, the ants also produce an antibiotic on their body that helps protect the fungi from a harmful bacteria. Which of these explains the relationship between leaf cutter ants and the fungi? So, A, predation, because the ants feed on the fungi. So, that isn't true. The ants do somewhat interact with the fungi, but they don't mainly, like, feed on it. Like, they, no, like, they don't, they don't feed on the fungi. Um, B, mutualism. Because both the ants and the fungi benefit from each other, that is correct. Because as y'all can see here, we can see the fungi depend on the leaves for nutrients. And the ants also produce an antibiotic on their bodies that helps protect the fungi from harmful bacteria. And at the beginning, you see here, leafcutter ants harvest plants and carry them to fungi that convert plant material into usable form for the ants to digest. So the fungi is helping the ant. And the ant is helping the fungi. So in, they're in a mutual relationship. They're in a mutual symbiotic relationship. So it's B, competition because both organisms consume the same resources for energy. That is not true because they do not feed on the same product. D, commemalism because the ants receive energy from the fungi and the fungi are unaffected. That is not true because at the beginning, well, here we can see the fungi... Uh, depend on the leaves for nutrients, and here, the ants also produce an antibiotic on their body that helps protect the fungi. So they each protect each other, so it's mutualism B. Now on to question 16. This is a codon chart question, which Mini Educator 2 will explain. Question 16. A model of transcription and a codon chart are shown below. Oh. Here's the transcription, and here's the codon chart. Which amino acid would be coded first from the DNA strand being transcribed? So if you know anything about um, bio, you know that transcription flips, um, it negates everything when it's becoming mRNA. And instead of, uh, instead of thymine, they replace it with uracil. So as you can see here, thymine goes to adenine. Adenine goes to uracil, uh, cytosine goes to guanine, and guanine goes to cytosine. So here it's AUG. And AUG, if we use that, this is the first base, A, second base, U, third base, G. So it's met because that's where they all meet. On to question uh, 17. Okay, now question 17. This is a tr tricky one, but we will work through it together. Why is it important to assign each organism a specific name? A, each specific name applies to only one species, making it universally identifiable to scientists. That is correct. Because, um, because... As scientists, as people who study in science field, we are all working together to identify animals and to just work together. So we need to give each species their own name. So people in Brazil can identify it. People in Iraq can identify it. People in the U.S. can identify it. People in China can identify it. Everybody can identify it. So A is correct. B, each specific name allows scientists to better study the behavior of an organism, but it does not make sense. For example, you have a kid named John. How is John? So what? I just look, oh, 
John, by his name, I understand that he loves to read books, that he likes social studies. That doesn't make sense. C, the scientific name allows scientists to develop common names for organisms. That is not true because we need this part that is set in A to make it universally identifiable to scientists. D, the scientific name describes how an individual looks relative to others of the same genus. No, a name does not make it how it looks. A name is used and only applies to, a scientific name applies to only one species and it makes it universally identifiable to scientists, so it's A. Answer is H because the gametes will contain new allele combinations. That is true because when you are crossing over, you are mixing alleles, you are mixing genetic information, you are creating genetic variety. So the answer is H. Uh, but yeah, and I apologize for that. But y'all, we are really busy right now. I mean, we are students in a high school, so we're just so busy, we have so much stuff to do. So yeah, I just thought I would come and record it and I will explain question 19 here with y'all. Students studying the interaction among the reproductive parts of flowering plants make the graphic organizer shown. Uh, here in the graphic organizer, we, should, we could see the blank attract pollinators. Pollen is deposited on the blank. The pollen grain grows and fuses with the blank. So let's see A. B, filaments attract pollinators. Pollen is deposited on the petals, and the pollen grain grows and fuses with the stigma. That is not true, because as biologists, we know that the petals do not deposit pollen. We know that. They do not deposit pollen, but instead, the stigma deposits the pollen. B, the petals attract pollinators. That's correct. Pollen is deposited on the uh, ovule, ovule. That is not correct because the pollen is deposited on the stigma. C, the filaments attract pollinators. We could just cross that right out because the petals are the things that attract the pollinators. D, the petals attract pollinators. Pollen is deposited on the stigma. The pollen grain grows and fuses with the ovule. That is Correct, because the the petals attract pollinators. If a pollinator, uh, if a pollinator sees, mm, my gosh, those petals look good. I'm gonna go there and I'm gonna pollinate them. Pollen is deposited on the stigma, yes, and the pollen grain grows and fuses with the uvule. So the answer is D. Okay, next question, question twenty. Um, what components make up the backbone of a DNA? molecule mini educator two take it away question number 20 what co uh, components make up the backbone of a dna molecule purines and deoxyribose purines don't do anything with dna uh, molecules g pyrimidines and purines they uh those are the bases um and they are cytosine and guanine and um they're the four bases separated into uh, two groups. Uh, H, deoxyribose and phosphate groups. They make up the backbone. So when, when they're talking about the backbone, they're talking about the um, outside part of the DNA molecule. So if you see if you uh, see a DNA image, you will see that it is like a twisted ladder. The outsides will be the, uh, the backbone. And J, uh, phas uh, phosphates, groups, and pyrimidines. And those don't do anything with DNA molecules. All right, on to question 21. Okay, a uh, prokaryotic cell and a eukaryotic cell are shown. Which characteristic best distinguishes these cells as either prokaryotic or eukaryotic? A, the organization of the genetic uh, material. That is correct. Because if you remember back to biology class, you remember that a uh, that a uh, eukaryotic cell has a set has a uh, nuclear membrane has a um, 
It has a nuclear membrane and it has a nucleus. The nucleus is where the genetic material is stored, but the prokaryotic does not have a nucleus. B, the location of the cytoplasm, that is not correct because cytoplasm doesn't really have a location. It's just everywhere. It's holding the organelles in place. C, the role of the cell membrane. Nope, that is not correct. In both of them, prokaryotic and eukaryotic, the cell membrane, the role of the cell membrane is to let things in and out of the cell. The function of the of the flagella, that is not correct because the flagella just helps with their transportation. So the answer is A, the organization of the genetic material, because in the eukaryotic cell, the genetic material is in the nucleus, while in a prokaryotic cell, the genetic material is just free-flowing. Um, but yeah, now on to question 22, Mini Educator 2, take it away. Which sequence best describes an interaction between the integumentary and excretory systems that help maintain a homeostasis? Um, F. Heart rates incre uh, increase to blood vessels constrict to blood pressure increases. That is not either of those systems. G. Blood vessel is damaged to uh, play te uh, tellets being uh, begin to clump uh, to blood vessel ruptures. That's also not part of the integumentary and excretory systems. H. Blood sugar uh, levels rise. Uh, pancreas secrete insulin and blood sugar continues to rise. That's neither of them. J. Body temperatures rise uh, and glands release sweat and body temperatures decrease. That's be uh, that is true because excretory re uh, is releasing all the um dirt uh, sweat bacteria um and it's also where um you remove toxins from your body now on to question 23 okay question 23 which statement best describes a similarity among trees cats and amoebas do not worry. This question might confuse you. You'll be like, what the heck? What do cats have to do with amoebas? Well, I'm here to explain them to you. A, they are prokaryotic organisms. That is wrong because, number one, we don't even have to look at trees and amoebas. Cats are eukaryotic um, because they are in anim animalia as us, as humans. Um, humans and cats and dogs and Practically all of the animals are, well, yeah, all of the animals are in, in the kingdom of Animalia. They are classified as members of the same kingdom. The cats, no, well, none of them are classified in the same um uh, in the same kingdom. We don't even have to look at amoebas for this one, but we just really as cats are in the kingdom of Animalia, while trees are in the kingdom of, of Plantae. C, they have genomes that consist of the same number of genes. That is not correct because if they had the same number of genes and the same number of chromosomes and the same types of genes, then they just look the same. Cats, trees, and amoebas would be the same thing if they had the same genomes and the same number of genes and the same types of genes, all that. D, they contain DNA composed of the same four types of nucleotides, which remember are guanine, cytosine, thymine, and adenine. That is correct because remember one thing that you have if you do not leave biology class with any knowledge, just remember this that the genetic code is universal. Remember that the genetic code is universal. So every single organism in the entire in earth, on earth, every single organism that you think of that is living has the same four types of nucleotides, has guanine, cytosine, adenine, and thymine. Remember that. Okay, now on to question. Uh, now on to question, well, we mix them up a bit. This question is 25, and this question is 24, but we will just stop at question 24. But we're just going to go now down to this question. Um, but yeah, again, just want to remind you all that this test only includes 25 questions, so this will be our last question. But now on to this question. Which characteristics do all organisms in kingdoms in Malia, Protista, and Fungi have in common? They are eukaryotic. And that is true because Animalia, Protista, and Fungi can all be eukaryotic. They're prokaryotic. 
No, uh, none of Animalia protista or fungi is prokaryotic. Um, they are unicellular. They can be unicellular, but not all of them are. And they are multicellular. Uh, again, some of them can be, some of them aren't. Like there's um, like protista. There are types of protista that are only uh, unicellular. Now on to question 25. Our last one. Students designed an experiment to model the carbon cycle. The students combined water and carbon dioxide, producing disks in a sealed flask. The flask represented the Earth's atmosphere and the plant represented the sun. Their, their design is shown. Which component can be added to the flask to reduce the concentration of carbon dioxide in the model atmosphere created by the disks? Let's see. Bacteria, okay, which component can be added to the flask to reduce the concentration of carbon dioxide in the model atmosphere created by the disk? F, bacteria to use carbon during nitrification? No, sir, because bacteria does not suck up the carbon dioxide. G, plants to absorb carbon in the... Sorry, y'all. Um, plants to absorb carbon in the process of photosynthesis. That is correct, because as y'all remember, in photosynthesis, the plants suck up the carbon dioxide and they produce oxygen for us so we can breathe and live. H, snails to use carbon through cellular respiration. That is not correct, because how cellular respiration works is in cellular respiration, cellular respiration doesn't use carbon. Cellular respiration uses uses oxygen and then produces carbon j mushrooms to absorb carbon during decomposition mushrooms do not absorb carbon during decomposition mushroom decomposers do not absorb anything decomposers literally just just break down material and just whoop it into the soil so the answer is g plants to absorb carbon in the process of photosynthesis Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that is it for today. We left off on question 25. We will be going over the rest uh, in part two of the video. But yeah, we thank y'all so much for watching. Make sure to like, subscribe, hit the notification button right next to the subscribe button to be notified whenever I upload a new whenever we upload a new video. And um, but again, um, if y'all have any questions over anything, questions one through 25, please just comment them down below. If if y'all are confused over uh, let's see here a question. If y'all are confused over question six, y'all are like, wait, how? Then just comment down below. Hey, hey, mini educators, we're confused on question six. Can y'all explain it? And we will explain it. We will do our best to explain it. But yeah, that is going to be it for today. Uh, is there anything you want to add, mini educator, too? No, we're good. Okay, that is going to be it. And we will see you all next time. Bye. Bye.